Yo, Charlie here, and here we have it, the all-new Atherton A200G. We're here in McCunkler in Midwales to look at Atherton's facility to see this incredible A200G downhill bike. This is one of one. It's the bike that Charlie Hatton is going to be racing this season, first at Hardline and then at the UCI World Cup downhill. We're going to be talking to the engineers, the designers and the people who put these incredible bikes together and then of course chat to Charlie to see what he thinks of his new downhill race bike. So Rob, you're head of design here at Atherton. Quite a big job, a lot going on. Um, I guess you're a busy man. Yeah, uh, busy and and lots of interesting stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of working for this company. Is there's 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 so much going on at any one time. Being mm -hmm. a company, it's always pushing innovation. Okay, so today we're obviously looking at the A200G, which is Charlie's race bike for the season. It's a pretty interesting bike, not just because it's you know an Atherton with all the 3D print stuff, but also because there's the pinion bolted into it and you know, the DW6 linkage and all this sort of stuff. So where did the process start to design and think about this bike? It really came about that Dave Weigel had a, a concept for his mid-pivot okay. uh, suspension system. That, that was the starting point. The basis of the mid-pivot is it gives a optimum rear axle path, which basically translates into, for your, for your sort of most active suspension, part of the suspension travel, um, it's, a, it's a near vertical axle path. So the benefit of that being that your wheelbase isn't changing as you're, as you're pumping into a corner, so the grip therefore is maintained evenly between your two tyre contact points. Yeah. We always knew that that would take the existing race bike and take it to a new level. So it was then a question of how do you, how do you actually ex execute that and engineer that? Because there are some practical problems with literally how you squash that mid pivot in to a in the proximity of a of a bottom bracket, okay. and obviously if, you, if you've got a regular derailleur drive system, you've got a 32, 34, whatever um, tooth chaining, mm -hmm. and you just run out of space. So the first thing was let's do this mid pivot because it's got all these suspension okay. performance benefits. Second was how do we package it? The gearbox because it's over geared allows you to use much smaller sprockets, right, which okay. means you can fit it all together without having to do a dual idler system or mm -hmm. something else that brings weight and complexity and potentially reliability issues. So that was the that was the sequence of events okay. in terms of performance and then packaging. And then obviously the, the gearbox allows you to use a belt, which brings its own advantages in terms of um, reliability, durability, and, and actually against quite a lot of common misconception, you do actually get efficiency gains okay. at that peak peak performance point right. of, of a you know, finish line sprint. I'm imagining you know, brands like Pinion and Gates were quite keen to potentially work with you guys. How did that conversation all happen? It, it happened very organically really, because um, it, it very quickly became these were the obvious partners to work with to execute this vision of what we wanted the race bike to be. Mm -hmm. And this was literally the conversation started around August last year. 2024? Yep. Wow. We knew it was really ambitious because obviously we weren't going to be able to do a lot of iterations uh, with prototypes mm -hmm. to get ready for the season and obviously give the races enough time on the finished bike to, to be up to speed by the yeah. first race. We're taking a bike that Charlie's literally been world champion on mm -hmm. and saying, no, we're going <laughs> to get rid of that yeah, yeah. and we're going to do something completely different, but you've got to trust us. Yeah. With a system that he's never ridden before, presumably. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, a lot of news. So belt, mid pivot and gearbox, yeah. so a lot of new stuff. And then and then all the, the, the chassis stiffness changes that inevitably are gonna come from that, mm. that new structure. Do you think this is a project that you could have done had you not worked in the way you do with 3D printing and, and, and lugs and all that sort of stuff? Could you have turned it around in six months, five months? No, I, th I think fundamentally, the manufacturing process we use and the way that we work as well where we have such a collaborative team, say where Dave Weigel is an integral part of okay. our team. You know, the riders are an integral part of the feedback process. And then we can react, we can, we can prototype the designs in a way that is, is completely uncompromised. So our, you know, our prototypes are also how we manufacture the finished product. Yeah. So there's no, there's no loss of subtlety between making an aluminium mule and then carbon cast like there's that I mean that's one of the real beauty you can refine the prototype to the nth degree and then know that the production one will be exactly the same mm -hmm. yeah I don't think there's any other way we could have 
people have been talking, you know, whether it's on the forums, in comments, or just in the general sort of chatter, about gearboxes and mountain bikes being the ultimate solution. Do you think they work better in a downhill setting where weight is less of a consideration? Maybe, you know, on a cross-country bike, if you're pedaling up a hill for 20 minutes, maybe that loss of efficiency is not going to be great. But on a downhill bike, maybe it doesn't matter if you're just putting a, a 2,000 watt sprint. It, does it feel like the best place for this technology right now? Yes, it's certainly a sensible starting point. I mean, as, as an example, Charlie was putting uh, 500 grams of lead okay. into his bottom brackets. You're putting weights where the riders are looking for more weight anyway. And you're taking weights away from your from your rear axle. Yeah. So you're only you're only improving the, the kinematics of the bike. Yeah. There are some compromises with a gearbox bike, but they're very quickly lost in in the in the noise of a, of a downhill Yeah, run. the heat of the battle actually, yeah. maybe a few watts here and that doesn't matter. Exactly, and, and, and the benefits of having well, a, a system that you just know is gonna work. Uh -huh. B, obviously all the, all the shifting options you've got, especially with a new sharp, smart shift system where you can shift under load, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, the, the bike is possibly one of the most hyped in the pits this season. Everyone is super excited to see it out there. So yeah, it's gonna be a really, a really cool sort of early season of racing just to see how good it really yeah, is. Yeah, for sure. And obviously Charlie's kind of handy on a bike. Now obviously we've cut down all the chats we've had with the engineers here, so if you want to see an uncut version of those discussions, let us know in the comments, because we'll put a full length video out soon. All right, so I'm with Will. We're here in Atherton's design facility. There's obviously some complex stuff going on on screen. It doesn't really make much sense to a lay person like me, but what is it that we're looking at here? So what we have on the screen now is the stress analysis for load case one, which for us is a sort of heavy bottom out on the, okay. on the pedals. We use this to sort of add bracing and material where it's needed. So where the red bits are, is that where you want a bit more material, for example? Yeah, so those red areas are where we, we would add more. These are still actually acceptable. They're sort of the peak stress that's shown here, but this is uh, the frame as it is after sort of several iterations of this where we've made minor tweaks and sort of reduced the stress in those areas. Okay. Is this somewhere where you can sort of work on the flex of a frame a little bit? Can you introduce design so that it flexes a bit more in a corner, for example, for traction? Or? Yes, exa exactly that. So we have a stress plot, which will help us sort of define whether the material is, is able to cope with the, the forces that are being applied. Mm -hmm. And then you also get a displacement plot and you can use that to, yeah, to tune in exactly how much the frame will flex as a whole mm -hmm. through a load. So typically we'll sort of start by getting that sort of stress analysis correct and yeah, making sure that it's, the lugs are sort of safe and you won't get any fatigue. And then after that, we'll tune in the amount of deflection at the sort of axle and the contact patch. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing on screen, is this basically what you'd see even before anything physical has been built? Yeah, yeah, so this existed uh, yeah, several weeks before we actually had lugs okay. in the building. We'll, we'll come up with a design that looks, I mean, it'll look similar to what is on the screen now after Rob's to sort of come up with that first design. And then it's a few weeks of sort of back and forth iteration to sort of turn it from an initial concept lug into one that is safe mm -hmm. and we can produce. Cool. And then you go back through the process again with some feedback. Yeah, so, so I'll generally load it into the simulation and run it and then I can recommend changes and highlight areas that are peak stress and feed that back to Rob and he'll, he'll make another version of the lug. Okay, we're here with Scott at the Renishaw Renam 500Q. It's a quite fancy bit of kit, but Scott, tell us a little bit about yourself and what is this thing? It's not quite your normal 3D printer. Yeah, so I'm a design engineer here at Athen Bikes. So this is a, a laser powder bed fusion machine. So this is what makes all of our titanium lugs. We load powder in and get parts out. We like this plate here. Great. So it's not like your standard kind of hobbyist 3D printer. Uh -huh. So we will load in a, a tie substrate. Yep. And um, so this is kind of the, the starting point of the build. And this is what the parts then get printed onto. Yep. Okay. And um, so the plate will get loaded into the bottom of the chamber. And as the print progresses, instead of the extruder on a hobbyist printer, kind of working away from the part, yep. the parts are essentially moving down. So as, as you kind of progress and create layers, the, the coater rail is going to the back of the machine, right. collecting a dose of titanium powder, and then it works back to the front of the machine, mm -hmm. um, and then the lasers can work across the build. And it lays that down in 60 micron layers, and then the plate will lower by another 60 microns, yep. lay another layer. So the lasers come in, they hit the powder, they melt the powder onto yes. itself, yeah, yeah. and then that's that. 
and then it's done another layer on top, another layer on top. Yeah, exactly. And you end up with a few thousand layers making up one of these. Yeah, so any, anywhere from kind of about two, two and a half thousand layers okay. per build. How long does it take to make the finished product? I'm guessing this is the finished product from the machine. Yeah, so this uh, is the belt bike. Yep. Um, so this is kind of our, our most recent development for the race team. So this one actually takes quite a lot longer to print just due to the physical size of the the kind of the gearbox housing lug. Okay. 25 hours plus, right. but normal build for kind of most of our kind of consumer bikes at the moment is about 18 hours to build. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this, this is kind of the current layer that we're working on now. Okay. Um, so we're 336 layers into this build. Yep. Um, so as you can see, that's basically a cross section, 336 layers up from okay. any of these build plates. Um, and then it works up and you'll see there's kind of very kind of oh, tiny changes in incremental, there. Incremental, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it's only, like I said, it's only 60 microns changing in height between each. Mm -hmm. But then obviously as you as you skip further through the build, you'll see much more drastic changes as you're working right, up through yeah. the parts. And what's the story then with the lasers moving across in the way they do? Because the, the bar goes that way, the lasers go that way. What's yeah, yeah. going on here? So it, this is probably quite a good screen actually to explain that. So each of these colors represents one of the lasers. Oh, so okay. we've, got, we've got four lasers in here. Right. So you see laser four is purple, laser one is green and uh -huh. so on. And so each of them are working in what we call swim lanes. So they're working from the left hand side of the bed over to the right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's done in that way to kind of go against the gas flow. So the argon is going in the opposite direction. And therefore any part that you've just mm -hmm. created, so you've just melted this area here, all the plume and debris that comes off that is getting taken right. left and then it can work right into really nice clean air. Yeah. Um, so they kind of work opposite one another right. for that reason. So this is the next size of the race bike. So it's literally just arrived okay. literally today. Um, so this is very similar to that one there, but just of a different size. And I'm doing the so, unboxing. Yeah, you crack on. So this is the first one we've, we've had through from Heat Street. Oh yeah. There you go, there it is. Don't drop it, Tom. <laughs> Okay. Wow, there we go. So you see most of this is very similar to this one here, um, but some of these front end parts are going be size specific. Okay. So this one's a slightly shorter reach mm -hmm. um, to give the race team more sizes to kind of play around with and test. So that says 455. Is that a 455 reach? Yeah. There you go, it's just 455 reach. Cool. All right, so we've been in the 3D printer, we've got our big chunk of metal, and then we take it to the Fettel room, which is a great name for something. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> is this the Fettling with things? What are you, what are you doing here? So this, this is essentially where the, the plates with all the parts and all the supports are taken down to the individual components. Okay. And then those components are taken through to kind of a near finished state, mm -hmm. ready to have any machine features kind of added. And yeah. All the key tolerances added through machining. Okay. So um, taken from like rough to hopefully not so rough. Yeah. So for example, this here is the seat stay brace. Um, so as you see, there's kind of all these different supports that are anchoring it down to the plate. Mm -hmm. They get removed. So there's kind of an air chisel process yeah. where this is kind of removed from the plate but you still end up with all these supports here. Yeah. So you see the kind of, essentially the witness marks of where those supports were contacting the part. So there's various kind of processes in there that we go through to essentially take that back. Okay. So these are these are hand finished then. So all your witness marks are gone. Um, it's a very clean surface. The guys are really good at kind of giving a, a nice detail to things. Once that's all finished, it will get shop blasted. Okay. So that takes off and kind of equals everything out if you yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, And that kind of uniform finish is good from like a stress perspective as well. Okay. All right then, so now we've done all our fettling. Is yeah. it just a case of sticking some carbon tubes in there and sending off to the people put into a bike or? Yeah, so not far off. Okay. Um, but So even once these parts are finished fettling, um, all the kind of interfaces and the critical tolerances are all kind of machined in. Right. And um, so we print like these head tubes, for example, we print the head tube with like machining stock. Right. So there's a small amount of extra material printed into that area mm -hmm. that can then be machined back. Right. So that process has a much higher level of precision. So here's a machined head tube. So that's ready for your, your headset cup. Mm -hmm. And the torrenting on that is really tight. So it's not someone with a file just... No. 
No, yeah. so that's a, a CNC machine. And then they're doused through with IPA to clean out all the joints and make sure everything is free of any contamination. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're bonded. So then they're loaded onto the jig, filled with glue. Okay. Tubes installed, etc. So bonding is what we'll think about next. Yeah, so bonding happens just in this next room along here. Jim's race bike. Where's yours, Tom? Uh, it's, it's coming, it's being built. So this is a very clean room because this yes. is where the bonding takes place. Yeah, yeah, so this is the bonding room. Um, so we can't go in and out of there. Yep. Um, so that's kind of totally free of any contamination. Okay. And um, the lugs get fully clean before they even enter here before they get a final clean again. Right. Um, so everything is totally immaculate before it makes its way onto the jig. Okay. And it's obviously not Pritt stick in there. What kind of materials are you using to bond the carbon tubes to the, the titanium lugs? Yeah, so it's a, it's a toughened epoxy basically okay. that's used to bond them. And what? how strong is that join? Like, is it like unbelievably strong or is there a little bit of flex in there or like? It is unbelievably strong. Right. Yeah, so the double lap joint itself um, obviously it's a clevis as opposed to, I know some other folk kind of do single lap joints, for example. Uh -huh. um, and this is kind of a, a big step up from that right. in terms of strength. How long does the glue take to dry? These bikes kind of stay on overnight. Okay. Um, and then they're left to cure for kind of a bit longer. We can't really go into all the details of the specifics of that. Sure. So they go from here, way to paint, and then back here again to get built up into a bike. Over there. All right, Charlie, so it's mid-January. How long have you been riding the bike? Because I'm guessing it's pretty new. Yeah, it is fairly new. Um, I got the bike on the 21st of December. Okay. So it was a little early Christmas present for me. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's feeling really, really good. Yeah. Is this like V1 of the bike or have you had a chance to sort of feedback and have there been any material changes to it? No, so this is literally the only bike we currently have. Um, I mean, we sort of sat down with the design team and the engineers and everyone and sort of planned out the map of what the process of the bike's gonna be. So cut it down into phases. Mm -hmm. So like phase one, phase two, phase three. So at the minute we're in phase one, which is just like troubleshooting and making sure everything works right. What's it like being able to ride for a team and a company that has such, you know, like quick prototyping and building, you know, like no other bike manufacturer can really do that so easily. Yeah, it is pretty incredible actually. Um, yeah, the last year I've really used that to my advantage, I think. And uh, yeah, especially with this bike, trying new bits is gonna be, yeah, it's gonna be good. Yeah, yeah. I think everyone kind of wants to know, like, what's it like to ride, both in terms of sort of like it being a downhill bike, a new one to you, but also, you know, the, the pinion system in there, the gates, carbon drive, you know, what's, what's it like? The best way to describe it for me would be like going from a trail bike to a downhill bike. Right. It feels like I can go into a downhill bike to like this super downhill bike. The bike is absolutely glued to the floor. And with the addition of the mid pivot as well, it just eats the bumps, tracks the ground so yeah. well. So yeah, it's a bit of an animal. And what's the system like? It's an electronically controlled gearbox? So yeah, electronic shifting, which is a bit of a, well, it seems like a bit of a party trick at the minute when you shift, everyone's like, what is that thing? Yeah. <laughs> it's actually a bit harder to get used to than I thought, um, but you can shift wherever you want and you don't need to pedal to shift, like change the actual gear. So for like a downhill race, obviously you don't pedal lows, but when you do pedal, you've got a very short window, so you need to make sure you're in the right gear. So I think having this system is very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. I can be thinking, okay, in three corners, I know there's a short straight, I've got to be in the right gear. I can shift in midair, not have to pedal. And I know as soon as I pedal, I'll be in that gear. So that is, yeah, yeah, definitely a big, big help. So for 2025, you're kicking off with Hardline Australia in a couple of weeks' time, and then there's obviously the full World Cup sort of circuit. Which track do you think this bike's going to work best on? Is, is it like steep, rough ones or less, more bike parky ones? I thought that. Um, we rode like, I thought on the flatter tracks it wouldn't be so great, but we've been riding obviously a lot of W Bike Park, and even on the flatter tracks, I think with the additional weight and the way the suspension platform works, it carries speed so well. So. Yeah. Yeah, this seems really good everywhere so far. I mean, obviously it's a really cool bike. I think everyone's seen a few sort of sneak peeks here and there and everyone's really stoked for it. So I'm sure everyone in the comments and of course everyone at MBUK is really excited to see you racing this year. So best of luck for the 2025 season and uh, yeah, go get it, man. Thank you very much. Yeah, super stoked and uh, yeah, can't wait to get to the races.